Uh, great to meet Will and uh, his family and so many of you guys who came out. What a wonderful state. It's a beautiful state. My wife is actually a graduate of Colorado Christian University, uh, which actually makes me wish I had gone here onto Westmont College, a uh, alleged Christian college in Santa Barbara, California, whose motto is Christus Prumatum Tenens, or Christ Preeminent in All Things. Except he wasn't preeminent in all things when he was in the womb as the prenatal Christ because Westmont College hires pro-abortion professors. And I could give you their names because guess who started the first pro-life club to have ever existed at Westmont College? Yes, that would be me. I'm still hated there. I'll never be invited back to speak in chapel. So when I had Jeff Hunt, the director of the Centennial Institute, who's an alum of Westmont College, on my podcast in January when we were in D.C., and he said, our goal at CCU is to become the most pro-life college in the country. I was like, wow, that's what we need more of in this moment. And uh, when parents come up to me and they ask me, you know, where, where, where should I send my kids to college? I, I have about five to six universities that I would feel comfortable left in this, in this country sending my children to, uh, Christian colleges, and CCU is one of them. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here, and I'm grateful to CCU uh, and Dr. Sweeting and the entire crew here allowing us to use the space. There's a lot I want to talk to you about this evening because we're living in what I call a Kairos moment, a real turning point for the country and the pro-life movement. Maybe you've heard that term before. You probably have. There's Kronos, right, which is, okay, it's uh, 524. Uh, then there's Kairos, which is quality of time. Uh, so we would say perhaps uh, Will Duffy knows what time it is, if you know what I'm talking about. Jeff Hunt knows what time it is. It's a time to stand. It's a time to fight. And no one understood the idea of Kairos better than perhaps Winston Churchill, uh, the man who saved Western civilization. In 1941, he said something so powerful and poignant that I think it bears repeating because I think we're living in a very similar moment in 2022. And here's what Churchill said. He said, the destiny of mankind is not decided by material computation. When great forces are on the move in the world, stirring all men's souls, drawing them from their firesides to cast aside wealth, comfort, and the pursuit of happiness in response to impulses that are awe-striking and irresistible, we learn that we're spirits and not animals and that something is going on in space and time and beyond space and time, which whether you like it or not spells duty. Now, it's very interesting because to my knowledge, and if we have any big history buffs in here, I'm happy to be corrected, but to my knowledge, I have not found evidence that Winston Churchill was a born-again Christian. I can't find a smoking gun where he professed faith in Christ. He was obviously functioning off of a Judeo-Christian worldview, but I mean, there's no evidence that he was a Christian, and yet he spoke with more spiritual clarity than most of the pulpits in Germany, which is one of the greatest critiques, of course, against German churches, right? The Deutsche Christens, is that, can you tell me the names of any of the pastors in Germany who were preaching Nazi bigotry from their pulpits with the veneer of Christianity, or just remained silent and portrayed their resistance to evil through proclamation, but not action-oriented resistance. No, you can't tell me any of their names because we forgot all of them. And your Churchill was speaking with more clarity than most of the pulpits. But it's very interesting, right? He says, something is going on beyond space and time. Well, there's only one who dwells beyond space and time. He who created space and time, breathed out the freaking Milky Way, laughs animals into existence, drops oceans, and says, it is good, and then makes you as the peak and pinnacle of his creation more valuable than anything else he has made, and gives us as human beings dominance and dominion, the first mandate, over the creation he has made for us to be stewards of. By the way, stewardship is a kind of an important concept in the Bible, if you've ever read it. Uh, Jesus takes the idea of stewardship quite seriously. And if we don't begin taking that idea as seriously now in this political moment where we, the people, are continuing to lose more and more rights, which shouldn't surprise us because we've been slaughtering children for 50 million years, then I think Christ might say the same thing to us he said in the parable of the talents. You ever read that parable, by the way? Shocking, very, very shocking and scary parable to read. <laughs> Regarding the man who buried the talent and did nothing with it, what does Christ say to that man? He will be thrown out into utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
you know, in our sanctimonious piety and self-righteousness, we might think, uh, Jesus, that's not very winsome. Uh, that's not very gracious. I don't really appreciate that inflammatory language. Uh, why couldn't you have said that about the sex traffickers um, and the abortionists? He doesn't say it about like some horrific evil that all of culture acknowledges as evil. He says it about the concept of not growing and stewarding that which you were given. If that doesn't tell you how seriously Christ takes the idea of stewardship, I don't know what will. Now, why do I say all of this? Because I think people are beginning to wake up and realize in this country that we the people are the sovereign and we have neglected to steward that duty of self-governance for too long. We've sat downstream to drink from the streams of liberty and enjoy the rights we've taken for granted but refuse to contend for for future generations. Which is why Reagan said freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day you will spend your sunset years telling your children and your children's children what it once was like to live in the United States where men were free. I'm here this evening to tell you that those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. And if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. Now, to go back to Reagan, Reagan actually understood this concept quite beautifully. Um, Lincoln was really the first conservative troll he really knew how to troll the left in their arguments quite well, and maybe we'll get into Lincoln later. But Reagan is kind of the one we acknowledge today as that before Trump, right? This sort of much more winsome than Trump, of course, uh, and much better rhetorician in, in trolling uh, sort of the left. And so Reagan, who used to be pro-abortion and, and signed legislation in California that led to further bloodshed of the unborn, becomes pro-life because of a woman named Dr. Mildred Jefferson, and he writes a book called Abortion in the Conscience of a Nation. Because Reagan understood that abortion really represents our national consciousness, doesn't it? It shows what we're willing to tolerate and make peace with. And Reagan understood that just as slavery was the litmus test of our republic in 1850, so abortion is the litmus test of our republic whenever he wrote his book. <laughs> and in it, he makes a beautiful connection between slavery and abortion, between Lincoln and his insight on the life issue. And here's what he says. He says, Abraham Lincoln recognized that we could not survive as a free country as long as some men could decide that others are not fit to be free and should therefore become slaves. Likewise, we cannot survive as a free country today as long as some men can decide that others are not fit to live and should therefore be abandoned to abortion and infanticide. So Reagan says, therefore, there is no cause more important than affirming than the transcendent right to life of all human beings, the right without which no other rights have any meaning. So if we were to paraphrase Reagan today, we might say, if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. Right? And I feel like American citizens, even those who are not radical pro-abortion activists, are beginning to wake up to the simple truth. We've been sowing apathy in the womb, and now we're reaping it in the streets. We've been sowing bloodshed in the womb, and now we're reaping it in the streets. The Bible says that bloodshed begets bloodshed. In Psalm 106, God tells the Israelites regarding their sacrificing babies to Moloch. He says, you've sacrificed your sons and daughters to demons. The land is desecrated with blood, and so I give you over to be ruled by those who hate you. Because of child sacrifice, God tells his people, I give you over to be ruled by people who hate you. If you're a Christian, I want you to ask yourself this question. Does it feel like we're being ruled by people who hate the bride of Christ in America? <laughs> well, more so in the last two and a half years than maybe at any other point in my lifetime, and I was born in 1991. We're starting to reach this breaking point. And if we go past the point of no return, my fear is that we will fulfill the prophetic cycles of history and simply descend back into the despotic chapters of history. America is the exception, not the norm. The natural rights of man are the exception, not the norm. A government created to recognize and protect those God-given rights is the exception and not the norm. But Americans are so 
fat on liberty, we've mistaken it for libertinism. And so as my pastor Rob McCoy says, we wait downstream to pick up human heartache that we helped create through our political apathy upstream. Meaning we refuse to advocate for where these ideas and policies flow from, and then we try to pretend like we're compassionate by caring for the victims of bad ideologies and policies. How about we contend upstream and exercise stewardship to point this republic back in the right direction. But none of that is going to happen as long as we continue to slaughter children in this country. And unfortunately, I believe, and with good reason, that the abortion industry fully intends to kill more children through abortion now that Roe v. Wade is overturned than before. Now, some of you are nodding, and you may understand what I'm getting at. But if you're thinking, OK, this, this freaking weirdo political commentator rube, what's he talking about? Roe v. Wade just got overturned. Of course, that means less abortions. Uh, that would be the case if it weren't for RU486, called the abortion pill. By the way, here's the uh, one minute or 45 second nasty history of the abortion pill. If you're not familiar with the eugenic racist legacies and ideological foundations of what we call the abortion industry today, here's one little vignette. RU486, that's the abortion pills taken through 10 weeks. You want to know what RU stands for? Roussel Ukloff. That's what the RU stands for, okay? Roussel Ukloff, majority shareholder, is named Hookst AG, okay? Hookst AG emerged from the breakup of the German chemical company known as IG Farben. IG Farben is infamous for creating a gas known as Zyklon B. The cyanide gas used to poison Jews in German concentration camps. So Hooks Day G simply shifted from creating poison to kill Jews to creating poison to kill babies. There's a 45 second vignette, and I could dive into Sanger later if you'd like, regarding some of the eugenic legacy of the abortion industry. So that's what Roussel Ukloff RU486 refers to. The abortion pill is a two regimen pill. Mifeprex or Mifepristone is the first regimen. It cuts off the hormone progesterone without which the lining of the uterus breaks down. So all the nutrients to the child through the umbilical cord is cut off and the baby starved to death. About 48 hours later, you take misoprostol or misoprostol, however you want to pronounce it, which forces your uterus to have contractions. And Planned Parenthood tells you, and I'm not joking, we've got this on camera. We have women who have recounted their experiences inside abortion centers, will tell you to sit on the toilet, don't look, and flush. So the American sewage system becomes the abortion industry's abortion disposal system. Because the Biden administration through the FDA last year removed the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy safety regulations on the sale of the abortion pill, it's a very, that's a big mouthful, but basically the safety regulations on the sale of the abortion pill prior to last spring were this. If you wanted to get the abortion pill as a pregnant woman, you had to show up at an in-person evaluation with a physician before you could get those deadly pills. Why? <laughs> well, the, believe it or not, the reason was not a pro-life reason. Pro-choicers supported this safety regulations. You had to ensure that the mother was not, did not have an ectopic pregnancy. Because how else are you going to diagnose that if you don't have an in-person evaluation with an ultrasound first? The second reason is to confirm gestational age. So I obviously have lots of pro-life obstetrician friends. And in fact, ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, did a study several years ago that found up to 50% of women are wrong on the date of their gestational age, how far along they are in their pregnancy. So women are often anywhere from one to five weeks off how far along they think they are in their pregnancy. But the abortion pill is only supposed to be taken through 10 weeks. Which, by the way, a few years ago it was eight weeks. And, and then uh, I think it wasn't Xavier Becerra. It was, it was one of the previous HHS directors who changed it and increased it to 10 weeks. No reason why, but it's now 10 weeks. So what happens when a woman thinks she's nine weeks pregnant, or at least from the last menstrual cycle, and she's really 12 or 13? What happens if she takes the abortion pill at 13 weeks, but she thinks she's eight or nine? Well, that often leads to incomplete abortions. Now, when I say incomplete abortions, I don't mean unsuccessfully killing the baby. The baby will probably still die. What I mean is incomplete abortions such that there are dead floating baby pieces in mom's uterus. Now, do you think that might pose any health risks to mom? Now, of course, the pro-life <laughs> solution is, well, let's ban abortion. <laughs> but pro-choicers supported these safety regulations because they didn't want women unnecessarily dying from sepsis infections. <laughs> So now they've gotten rid of those safety regulations, so women can now get the abortion pill through the United States Postal Service. And you can jump onto a pill mill website, and these, are, these pills are often sent from India. 
By the way, I have, I have a pro-life uh, activist friend. He's a dude. Um, and uh, he pretended to be a woman, which is very, that's happening a lot today in America. A lot of men are pretending to, did you, did you know? Okay, anyways. Uh, and so he poses a woman online on the, one of these pill mill websites to get the abortion. And he got it, no problem, no problem. And so sex traffickers now are very grateful writing fan mail and thank you letters to Joe Biden, the alleged president of the United States, because by removing the safety regulations, sex traffickers can now pretend to be 19-year-old women. You don't have to send a picture of your license and you don't have to jump onto a Zoom call to show your face. So they're now getting abortion pills and slipping it into the drinks of their sex workers to keep their uterus active in case they get pregnant. So once again, just so you know a little bit about this administration, uh, they're perfectly fine. Uh, cozying up to some of the most disgusting degenerates in this country, sex traffickers. And do you really think that Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, AOC, the entire liberal regime, do you really think that they're so stupid that they don't know that that's a negative consequence of their policy? No, they freaking know it, and they don't care. Regarding ectopic pregnancies, this is, this is a doozy, and, I've, and of course I've learned this from pro-life obstetricians and gynecologists, as well as my own research. The pressure and side effects you feel when you have an ectopic pregnancy, which is when the baby implants in the fallopian tube, is very similar to the experience your body will go through when you take Mifeprex. So when women get the abortion pill through the mail and they're sitting at home after taking the first regimen of the abortion pill, even if their fallopian tube's about to burst, they think, well, the telemedicine doctor told me that this experience is normal after taking the first regimen of the abortion pill. And then her fallopian tube bursts and she bleeds out internally and is dead on her bathroom floor. Now you're not gonna hear about these stories from the activist media, which I call journalistic prostitutes for the culture of death. But if you'd like to find them, you can find these stories of parents who have found their dead teenage daughter on the bathroom floor. Because she had an ectopic pregnancy that was never diagnosed. Because the Biden administration through the FDA removed the in-person safety regulations on the abortion pill. So for all of those reasons, brothers and sisters, you should expect more unborn children to be killed in America after the overturning of Roe versus Wade than before. Now, I'm not obviously saying that therefore I wish Roe v. Wade hadn't gotten overturned. <laughs> That's not the takeaway from that. It just goes to show how committed these people are to killing babies. And you know what? they know they're killing babies. And let me actually explain why, rather than just make that statement, if you're somewhere in the middle or you're on the fence or you're newly pro-life and you try to assume good about the other side, which I understand that's a fundamental human instinct to do. We want to assume the best interests in others. We want to assume that they are people of good faith. And knowing people who used to work in the abortion industry and knowing people who have gotten abortions and performed them, I think there are some people in the lower echelons of the abortion industrial complex who truly are poisoned by the streams of liberalism and they are held captive by faux compassion and they think that what they're doing is loving and supportive to pregnant women. But the people at the tippity top of this culture war and this genocidal agenda to wipe out the image of God in the womb, do you really think those people don't know what they're doing? Do you really think they don't know it's a human being and a baby? Of course they do. And let me tell you this, not because I think so, brothers and sisters, but because they've told us that they know that they're killing babies. Every once in a while, you'll get what I call a pontiff of progressivism, a high priest, <laughs> of secular progressivism, which is, by the way, this is how we should view this battle as an alternative religion, not an alternative politics. And we can get into that later. Of course, today's high priest of secular progressivism, of course, goes by the name Dr. Anthony Fauci, an unelected bureaucrat. Presidents come and go, but Fauci remains, except, of course, he just said, I'll be uh, retiring right at the end of the Biden administration. And did you hear he actually publicly confessed on national television that the reason why was because he said the GOP would be less likely to target him for investigations if he was no longer in his position. Uh, ho hopefully there are enough people left in the GOP with spines so that will ensure that won't happen. And uh, by the way, that's not off track of this lecture. Um, Fauci is one of the largest pro-abortion demonic forces in the liberal establishment today. 
Through the NIAID, he funds the University of Pittsburgh, where they abort children in the second and early third trimester. They scalp their heads. And by the way, I could show you the photos from Judicial Watch in case you think I'm some fake news conspiracy theorist. They scalp the heads of the children like one of Elizabeth Warren's old Indian war gods. They take the scalps of those babies and they insert them subcutaneously on lab rats. And the lab rat begins to grow the infant human hair that would have grown on the scalp of that precious infant had they not been aborted in the womb. Fauci funds that. We're going to have to apologize to the Nazis, folks. Because you see, they call that a humanized mice because it now has human cells in it. So they use that to perform experiments to find solutions to staph infections. So notice, guys, the baby simply becomes a sacrifice on man's pursuit for eternal life. Does that, sound, uh, does that sound new? No, pagan societies have always sacrificed human beings, children, babies, and adults, to the war gods, the sex gods, the weather gods, and the crop gods, <laughs> with the belief that they would receive a blessing in return from this pagan sky god, <laughs> and their lives would improve. They would get to live a little bit longer. So once again, just to make this point, we're not contending against an alternative politics, like an alternative political vision for the country. We're contending against an alternative religion, a religion that's, that, that's built on the mutilated bodies of 65 million children. Never forget Bernie Sanders in 2019 at the Climate Catastrophe Town Hall said, and I, I almost quote to you verbatim, I almost quote to you verbatim. He said, one of the solutions to the climate catastrophe is we need to fund abortions in poor countries. <laughs> Oh, yeah, those poor black people. I mean, ooh, we don't want too many of them reproducing. Uh, of course, Bernie Sanders never volunteers to suicide himself as one of the older members of the American Republic. And if we have an overpopulation problem that's infecting the environment that's therefore causing climate change, why don't you volunteer, you degenerate communist? But of course, notice it's, it's always younger people, and it's typically people with darker skin, which has always fulfilled the vision of Margaret Sanger and her eugenicist pals. And this is why, of course, you know, people like uh, Bill Gates, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, George Soros are obsessed with funding abortions in majority black countries. Uh, never forget that. It's one of the most creepy, dystopic, demonic features of progressivism is the, that they, they say part of progress is helping fund reproductive health care, they say, and sex ed in poor black countries. <laughs> Ooh, we don't want too many black people reproducing. Uh, in fact, Kamala Harris just admitted this. Uh, just so you know, I'm not just referring to old, you know, news clips that you think I'm taking out of context to make a Republican talking point. Kamala Harris just said this last week. I covered it in my podcast. She said, um, women are getting pregnant every day in America, and this is a real issue. <laughs> and I, and, by, and by, by the way, I quote to you verbatim. I did memorize that. I covered it. She, that's, that was a verbatim quote from Kamala Harris the other day. Right before she said, I'm Kamala Harris. My pronouns are she, her. I'm wearing a blue suit. It's like, good Lord. We are through the looking glass now. Um, in case you haven't noticed, secular progressivism really does rot the brain. Um, but to go back to her comments, why is that a real issue? Why is it a real issue that women are getting pregnant every day in America? That, it is an issue in the sense that that's a wonderful issue we should be focusing on. We've been under replacement rate in America for decades now. We are quite literally a dying country. And when you stay under replacement rates for too long, you do not last forever. Name me one civilization that has, that has uh, lived for eternity. None, except the kingdom of God. Right? We are a dying country, and China's over there licking their lips, just waiting to take over the country that has murdered more unborn children than any other regime in world history. Never forget, under the one-child policy, China is responsible for aborting, murdering over 100 million unborn children, and forcibly sterilizing millions of women as well. And our president, alleged president, can't even finish a sentence without reading repeat line, period, as he reads the teleprompter. We're the laughing stock of the country, and we've allowed people into positions of power for decades who believe that abortion is a fundamental human right. This is what these people believe. It's what they believed for decades. And unfortunately, we only have ourselves to blame. Edmund Burke was right when he said the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do Nothing. Reagan said, evil is powerless when the good are unafraid. But we've been so afraid of our reputations, of our careers, and such is the position the country is in today. So I believe we're at a very decisive Kairos moment right now. 
And I believe that the overturning of Roe versus Wade was a providential intercession of the Lord to say, I still intervene in the affairs of men and all is not lost. And by the way, there were some very interesting, dare I say, providential pieces of happenings on June 24th when Roe v. Wade was overturned that caused me to quote Churchill, something is going on. <laughs> Did you notice any strange things that happened on June 24th? Now listen, I am not one who seeks for signs and wonders, okay? I know Christ said it is a wicked generation that seeks for signs and wonders, <laughs> but it is also a stupid generation that ignores signs and wonders. And so on June 24th, now listen, I'm a Protestant, I'm not a Catholic, but I obviously have lots of Catholic friends because I'm in the pro-life movement full-time. June 24th is the nativity of John the Baptist. When we celebrate John the Baptist recognizing the fetal Christ, when Mary walks into the room pregnant with God, who is at that moment knitting John the Baptist together in the womb because he is the prenatal creator in the womb, therefore he is knitting himself together in the womb as the prenatal deity in the womb. <laughs> Incarnation, right? By the way, if you're a Christian and you feel like you've lost some of the wonder of your faith, wake up every morning and think about the Incarnation for 20 minutes, and you'll head off to work going, whoa, why? And, and for the secular progressives who say that Christians are such like, you know, mysticists, what a weird, you, know, you eat the body of Christ, you freaking weirdos. Um, just say, dude, you believe men can be women and men give birth through their urethra. Shut up. Don't talk to me about mystic weird beliefs, okay? Because actually secular progressivism, this alternative religion, is built on an old uh, church heresy called Gnostic dualism or body self-dualism. Some of the old Christian Gnostics, you know, who believe that there was like special knowledge and if they, if they threw off the constraints and bondage of the body and focused on the thoughts and consciousness and desires, you know, they would be truly woke and could be more spiritual than their other brothers and sisters. And the church has declared this a heresy for centuries. And so secular progressivism is just built on one of the most ancient dangerous heresies that's ever existed in the church. <laughs> so it's like, next time they tell you, it's just, oh, it's just an alternative politics. No, it's an alternative religion. You believe that the body means nothing because the body provides no rational basis for our moral decision making. So if you have a penis, but you feel like Sally lives inside, then the real person is not the body. It's the thoughts, aims, consciousness, and desires of who you feel you are on the inside. <laughs> and we're told that that's just following the science. No, that's an old ancient heresy that says that real people are not bodies. Real people are their thoughts, aims, consciousness, desires, and cognitive abilities. This also undergirds their support of abortion, by the way. The baby may be a human, but they're not a person because real people evidence thoughts, aims, consciousness, and desires. In other words, cognitive abilities and functional properties rather than on simply being human. So just, it was just a fun aside that I needed to make that we are contending against an alternative religion and we need to say it as such. By the way, uh, if you're like a, what, what, what are we called now, anti-vaxxers, if you're just against the mandates, like if you're pro-vax but you're against the mandate, you see how they redefined that during COVID, they said that you're an anti-vaxxer. If you vaccinated all your children, you just don't want a mandate for it. <laughs> so by the way, if you're, if, if you're kind of with me on this and you're like, I ain't ever taken the Fauci ouchie, uh, then let me just give you a, a fun little way to take the premises of Gnostic dualism to their most rational conclusion. I would like to take this opportunity right now to publicly announce that, yes, I do. I do identify as trans-vaccinated. <laughs> and last year, I, I admitted that I'm actually Sally. And I was able to liberate Sally from the bodily bondage of the Seth physical prison. And so having been very accustomed to the journey of liberating the real person from the bondage of biology and changing my pronouns on my driver's license, I'd also now like to take this opportunity to say, I have discovered the way to liberate my vaccination status from the bodily constraints of my bodily prison. I may not have the spike protein because I never received the Fauci ouchie, but I always felt like I was born in a vaccinated body. 
And so because biology provides no rational basis for who the real person is in the real world, I have now chosen to come out as trans-vaccinated. And I'll also be changing my vaccination status on my vaccine passport. And I'm very excited for my liberal friends in the culture of death to, one, welcome my opinion as a woman on the issue of abortion, who can speak to the issue with as much biological authority as them, as Sally hear me roar, but also as one who is also, too, trans-vaccinated. <laughs> Hashtag vaxxed V. <laughs> and I'd like you to refer to me by my vaccination pronouns, please. Now, of course, you're laughing at all this because you recognize this is such asininity. However, it's the same philosophy. If the body and the physical reality provides no rational basis for who we actually are as persons, therefore, the fact that I have male chromosomes and a phallic does not mean I cannot be a woman, then therefore, it is just as logical to say that the biological reality of my physical body that doesn't have the Fauci spike protein in it does not mean that I cannot identify as a vaccinated person and imprint my vaccinated preferences onto my physical body. Now, if that doesn't make sense, then neither does transgenderism. And if that doesn't make sense, then neither does being pro-choice. Because in each circumstance, they deny that the body is the real person. They believe that the body is just a shell for the real you. And so now we're sort of at the entryway to the philosophy of personhood arguments that pro-abortion advocates make today. They will admit that the unborn child is a human, but they'll say it's not a person. By the way, next time you hear someone say that, I've got two questions for you, if you'd like, okay? First one is, what's the difference between a human and a person? Any answer they give you will be a difference found in varying degrees amongst all born people as well. So the argument for killing the unborn child in the womb cannot be confined to the womb. Those arguments work equally well to dehumanize and kill born people as well. Here's the second question when someone tells you that the unborn, it's a human, but it's not a person. Uh, say, have you ever met a human that's not a person? Because I haven't. And that, I would love to meet a human non-person. Do you have any photos on your iPhone? Can I see one? Well, that pro-abortion advocate would probably take you in a time machine with Marty McFly back to 1850s America. Oh, right. Right. When the same political party said the same words about a different victim class. Isn't that what Dred Scott v. Sanford said? Notice, the racists of that day never made arguments that the black man was not a homo sapient, that he was not a biological human being. Their arguments were to deny him his personhood. The Nazis never argued that Jews were not humans. They argued that they were subhuman or not persons. Untermensch. What does Untermensch mean? Subhuman or underman. By the way, just as a quick aside once again, to give you a little vignette into who Margaret Sanger and the high priest of Planned Parenthood was. Margaret Sanger's, one of Margaret Sanger's board members was a man by the name of Lothrop Stoddard. Lothrop Stoddard sat on her board when it was called the American Birth Control League before it was renamed Planned Parenthood. Lothrop Stoddard was a high official of the Massachusetts Ku Klux Klan. Lothrop Stoddard wrote a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. Lothrop Stoddard wrote another book where he used the term underman. And the Nazis credit the use of that word to Lothrop Stoddard. The Nazis got the term Untermensch from one of Margaret Sanger's board members. So when you hear, you know, Republicans with spines like Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley or other political commentators that we like, like Michael Knowles or Charlie Kirk, talking about the racist eugenic history of Planned Parenthood, that's not just hyperbolic 
you know, whipping people up into a frenzy in order to own the left. That is part of the history of Planned Parenthood. Anyways, the Nazis never said that Jews were not humans. They called them Untermensch, subhuman, or Lebensunwertensleben, life unworthy of life. Oh, so they're acknowledging that the Jew is life, that it is a human being. Right, and in 1973, Justice Blackman writes in Roe versus Wade, the term person, as used in the Constitution, does not include the unborn. The practitioners of genocide have always created categories of humans and, no, and, and human persons and, and human non-persons to dehumanize their victim class and define them out of existence to make their mistreatment or murder more socially acceptable in the public consciousness. So notice the left will always redefine words and redefine definitions in order to keep <laughs> what the communists called useful idiots, to keep them quiet and asleep to their true agenda. They won't define baby, therefore they won't protect her. They won't define woman, therefore they won't protect her. Wake up. Who will they pretend to not be able to define next? So you see, if you attended this lecture this evening and you call yourself pro-life, but you're not as burdened for the plight of the unborn as I am, this lecture is just as much for you as for the pro-life activists in our midst. Why? Because the longer you tolerate the genocide of abortion, the sooner you will find that your own rights no longer exist as well. Dr. Mildred Jefferson, the woman who turned Reagan pro-life, was the first black woman to graduate from Harvard Medical School started the National Right to Life Committee before 1973, one of the oldest pro-life organizations in the country, once said, today it is the unborn child. Tomorrow it is likely to be the elderly or those who are incurably ill. Who knows? But that a little later, it may be anyone who has political and moral views that do not fit into the new distorted order. Tomorrow has been here for quite some time, and just a little bit later is here now. This is why if you were outside of the Capitol on January 6th, and you didn't even enter the Capitol, you too might have been thrown in prison. But if you burnt down whole city blocks under the name of systemic racism and anti-racism and BLM and Antifa, the 2B sitting president, vice president of the United States was tweeting out fundraising links to contribute to pay the bail of domestic terrorists that murdered innocent business owners and burnt down their businesses. And we were told that was mostly peaceful. Now listen, I'm not here to start making political jokes or commentary about other issues, but listen, for too long, the pro-life movement has ignored the urgency of other related issues because we've wanted to stay in our lane. And I get it. I'm a pro-life speaker and activist. I just launched a new organization called the White Rose Resistance. I want to end abortion. That is our goal. But we're only in the position we're in because we failed to recognize that for the secular progressive movement, abortion was not just one among many rights. It was the linchpin upon which the entire establishment of liberalism swings. What do I mean by that? When we say if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right, did you know the left has sort of a political antonym for that statement? They have a very similar belief, but in an inverted way. They believe something like this. If you can get the right to life wrong and invert the right to life, and you can get American citizens to remain apathetic towards or supportive of abortion, there's nothing else we cannot get them on board with being apathetic towards. In other words, if, if, if our government continues to ignore the right to life of an entire class of human beings, 
our own rights will constantly be endangered by modern jurists and a ruling class whose jurisprudence is completely foreign to the Founding Fathers. By ignoring the natural right to life that all human beings have, we should not be surprised when that government ignores every other right that flows from that first and most important of all rights. Which is, by the way, this is the reason why there's no such thing as a pro-choice conservative. You've never met a pro-choice conservative. Because if you're pro-choice, you are by definition uh, not a conservative. Conservatism is built on this idea that we should conserve fundamental human institutions built on natural law, the recognition of natural rights and their source, and a government institute am among men to recognize and protect those rights, and, and spreading power across institutions and people and the country in order to ensure that the despotic tendencies of Fauci-like tyrants isn't allowed to flourish in this republic. But you cannot conserve liberty. You cannot conserve freedom. You cannot conserve the right to bear arms. You cannot conserve the right to free speech. You cannot conserve the pursuit of happiness if an entire class of human beings are denied that first and most important of all rights. And now it's moving from the unborn to the elderly who also fail to meet the progressive's Gnostic dualist understanding of personhood. Because if the unborn is not a person with no right to life, because they cannot immediately exercise certain cognitive, function, cognitive functions and abilities, then by that same reasoning, elderly citizens with dementia and Alzheimer's who cannot immediately exercise certain cognitive abilities and functions would also fail to meet the left's litmus test for personhood. Who will be next? Who will the left pretend to not be able to define next? So you see, we're in a very important moment right now. And I want you as pro-life individuals, not just to see the battle for what it really is, but to feel confident in your beliefs and equipped to make the case for life in the public square. The White Rose Resistance, the new organization that I founded, exists to educate and expose culture to the evil of abortion until every person has the right to be born. We play offense with a sense of urgency to win the American abortion war. We don't sugarcoat our truths, as you might have seen in that video. We call a strike a strike, and we daily sharpen our spear of truth to make her edge as piercing as possible because we're past the point of playing nice. We're past the point of being winsome. It's time to stop trying to wake up the other sheep and try to wake up the other sleep lions. Awaken other warriors in this moment to contend on the battlefield of life and liberty. But folks, they know they're killing babies. And if we understand that, then we should respond in kind. California Medicine, a pro-abortion journal, medical journal that favors abortion, wrote in 1971, oh wait, that's two years before Roe versus Wade. They wrote in 1971 that everyone really knows that human life begins at conception. Let me quote this to you because you're being told a lot right now that, that we can't really know when human life begins. You're being told by the mainstream media and the activist media that there's broad disagreement on when human life begins. In this video, I don't know if we got to it or not, but at one point I say, well, human life begins at conception. And this, this woke pink-haired feminist goes, no, we don't know that. No, 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 but we, we, haven't, we haven't discovered when human life begins. And they're broad disagreement. So, so here is California Medicine, a pro-abortion medical journal in 1971. Here's what they had to say. They said, since the old ethic has not yet been fully displaced, what was that old ethic? The Judeo-Christian ethic? Since the old ethic has not yet been fully displaced, it has been necessary to separate the idea of abortion from the idea of killing, which continues to be socially abhorrent. The result has been a curious avoidance of the scientific fact, which everyone really knows, that human life begins at conception and is continuous whether intra or extra uterine until death. The very considerable semantic gymnastics that are required to rationalize abortion as anything but taking a human life would be ludicrous if they were not often put forth under socially impeccable auspices. It is suggested that this schizophrenic sort of subterfuge is necessary because while a new ethic 
is being accepted, that old ethic has not yet been rejected. Does that sound like, follow the science, or does that sound like a philosophical view of personhood that's masquerading as science in order to keep the American polity silent? They're saying we all know it's a human being, and they said that in 71, and that's not a national right to life paper. That's from California Medicine. They all know they're killing babies. Do you know that? Naomi Wolf, ever heard that name? Naomi Wolf, one of the most lauded pro-abortion feminists in the American culture wars, who very interestingly is having like a political reawakening before our very eyes. Is, there, is anyone following this right now? Naomi Wolf has turned into a massive liberty fighter alongside people like my pastor Rob McCoy and Charlie Kirk against vaccine mandates. No, 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 no one sees how hilarious that is? She says, bodily autonomy! Wait, but you're compromising the bodily autonomy of unborn children. No, it's just her body. There's no other bodies involved. And now she's defending real bodily autonomy against vaccine mandates. And she wrote a piece in her Substack entitled, I'm not brave, you're just a um, pansy. Let me use a more appropriate term for this audience. And in this piece, she says, all these men are coming up to me saying, you're so brave for fighting against this stuff because I agree with what you're saying and it's wrong. I just can't say it. So she writes a piece called, I'm not brave, you're just a pansy. And now she's showing up at Robert Kennedy Jr. like anti-vax rallies. Anyway, it's just an important point to make a larger point. We as Christians should always treat people as the opportunity and not the enemy. And we should welcome people into the canoe as we, stream, as we paddle up the streams of liberty to take them back to its source. God himself. Life and liberty are not man's idea, they're God's idea. But because eternity is written on the heart of man, you get pro-abortion activists like Naomi Wolf getting awakened to the love of liberty and fighting alongside crazy pro-life activists. Let's pray she comes all the way home. Anyways, Naomi Wolf is one of the most honest pro-abortion activists in the country. And when pro-aborts are honest, it's like almost more disturbing because of it, right? When they admit like, yeah, we know we're killing babies, it's like, <laughs> I mean, thanks, I guess, for being intellectually consistent, but it's like that much more disgusting because of it. However, she made this line where she says everything I'm telling you right now, that they all know they're killing babies. Here's what she said. She said, clinging to a rhetoric about abortion in which there is no life and no death, we, who's we? She's talking about pro-aborts. We entangle our beliefs in a series of self-delusions, fibs, and evasions. And we risk becoming precisely what our critics charge us with being, callous, selfish, and casually destructive men and women who share a cheapened view of human life. So Naomi Wolf says, so we need to contextualize the fight to defend abortion within a moral framework that admits that the death of the baby is a real death. They all know they're killing babies. Do you? How about Faye Waddleton, the former president of Planned Parenthood in 1997, gave an interview to Miss Magazine, and here's what she said verbatim. She said, I think we have deluded ourselves into believing that people don't know that abortion is killing. So any pretense that abortion is not killing is a signal of our ambivalence, a signal that we cannot say, yes, it kills a fetus. Wow, president of Planned Parenthood. How about Alan Guttmacher, the president of Planned Parenthood, who in his book Life in the Making, on page three, wrote, regarding whether people knew when human life begins, he said, quote, this all seems so simple and evident that it's hard to picture a time when it wasn't part of the common knowledge. Wow. How about Dr. Warren Hearn? A prolific and infamous abortion that you know well, who wrote a textbook called Abortion Practice, the leading medical textbook today that trains future doctors on how to kill 
babies. And Dr. Warren Hearn said at a Planned Parenthood conference years ago, he said, we have reached a point in this particular technology where there is no possibility of denial of an act of destruction by the operator. It is before one's eyes. The sensations of dismemberment flow through the forceps like an electric current. They all know they're killing babies. Do you, and what will you do about it? Dr. Martin Haskell is credited with creating what came to be called partial birth abortions, banned at the federal level, level under Bush, but not thanks to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who tried in two different Supreme Court decisions to keep partial birth abortions legal. Did you know this? Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in two different Supreme Court decisions, one from a state, and I forget, it was Wisconsin or Michigan, I can't remember the state, they had banned partial birth abortions, it went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. Because it's a sometimes necessary procedure to save the life of the mother. And that was how the Supreme Court was able to get away with keeping partial birth abortions legal. By the way, a partial birth abortion is where you, t you pull the baby out by their feet first, but you don't deliver all of the child. You leave the head and shoulder blade in the vaginal canal, and you take Metzen bomb scissors, and you stick it into the back of the neck of the birth canal right here. You open the scissors, you create a cavity, you stick a vacuum suction catheter tube into the back of the head, and you suck the brains out. The head collapses, and then you tear the child out. But you see, that's not infanticide. I know you guys live in reality, and you would just say, well, that's freaking infanticide. But see, you're not woke. You're a bunch of stupid Republican rubes. So listen, I'm here on behalf of Anthony Fauci. I'm here to tell you to follow the science. That was just an abortion. It wasn't infanticide. Now, of course, that's infanticide, but they're able to get away with calling it just an abortion because the baby is still partially in the mother's body. And ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, changed their definitions prior to that Supreme Court decision from saying that partial birth abortions are never medically necessary to save mom's life to saying it's a sometimes medically necessary procedure to save mom's life. So that's a little bit of, once again, the redefinition of words and terms to accrue more political power. So Martin Haskell invented this procedure. And I want to tell you just a very short story as we start to wind down right now, because I think it actually makes a very important point. The left maintains that abortion is a fundamental women's right issue because of bodily autonomy, and that no one should be forced to use their body to provide care for or sustenance for another human being. And in the Q&A section, we can get into any arguments you want. But they'll say stupid things like, well, should I be forced to give my kidney to someone else? <laughs> and then I go, well, no, you shouldn't. They go, I got you. And they say, therefore, the woman shouldn't be forced to use her organs to support the child that she created consensually in 99% of all cases. <laughs> and then they say, well, that's just the same thing. OK, we'll get into that later. It's very asinine arguments. But what they're saying is bodily autonomy. That's what they're saying, right? And as long as the baby is in the mother's body, it's the mother's choice as to whether she chooses to continue providing support or withholding support. <laughs> but guys, withholding support is just a euphemism for dismemberment. The woman's not withholding support. She's paying an abortionist to actively kill the child. OK, anyway. So partial birth abortions present a visceral, disturbing, but effective opportunity to make a moral point, to make a moral argument. Here's what I mean by that. If the bodily autonomy argument holds up, and if the property bodily autonomy argument holds up, it would follow that that child has no rights until it fully exits the mother's body. Because as long as it's still in her body, it's her choice. Hasn't that been the mantra since the 70s? My body, my choice, okay? Well, then what would be wrong with killing a child that's partially in the womb? You see, according to the la-la land of secular progressivism, there is a fetus fairy. And the fetus fairy flies up during childbirth and sprinkles magical personhood conferring fairy dust on the child as it exits the birth canal. So when that last toe leaves the birth canal, the doctor says, oh my gosh, it's a person! 
Now, nobody actually believes that. We recognize how stupid that is because it's not like the child is gradually becoming a person only as it moves six inches from womb to world, from womb to the doctor's waiting hands. However, if that's their belief and it is a coherent belief, then I guess the feet, legs, and buttocks of the baby partially delivered as a person, but the head and shoulder blades aren't. Right? Wouldn't that follow? So therefore, what's wrong with basically resorting to what would be the sort of equivalent of a French guillotine for unborn children? Chop their heads off, suck their brains out, because that was still in her body. Now, you'd be hard pressed to find a leftist who can defend that position. But we've been talking a lot of ideologies and arguments. Let's put a little bit of flesh on this conversation because I think it's important for us to remember what we're fighting against. It's very easy for pro-lifers to remain in the ideological realm. And I'm telling you this because I know what this is like. I've been speaking full time on this since I was 22 and I've been giving public speeches since I was 19 and I turned 31 at the end of the month. I cannot live in the daily presence and realization of murdering 3,000 children every day. It's, it's almost psychologically necessary for full-time pro-life activists to almost remain in the ideological camp, at least for some frame of the day or week, before they go back out and do more sidewalk counseling. It's, it's impossible to live in that reality 24-7, but I think it's important for us to return to what we're fighting against. A nurse named Brenda Pratt Schaefer once worked for abortionist Martin Haskell. And she testified before a congressional subcommittee in 1995. And here's what nurse Brenda Pratt Schaefer had to say. Dr. Haskell brought the ultrasound in and hooked it up so that he could see the baby who was 26 and a half weeks into pregnancy. By the way, you want to know the youngest baby ever born and survived and is now two years old? That baby was born at 21 weeks and one day. 26 and a half weeks. On the ultrasound screen, I could see the heart beating and I asked Dr. Haskell and he told me, yes, that is the heartbeat. As Dr. Haskell watched the baby on the ultrasound screen, he went in with forceps and grabbed the baby's legs and brought them into the birth canal. Then he delivered the body and arms all the way up to the neck. At this point, only the baby's head was still inside. The baby's body was moving. His little fingers were clasping together. He was kicking his feet. All the while, his head was still stuck inside. Then Dr. Haskell took a pair of scissors and inserted them into the back of the baby's head. Then he stuck a high-powered suction tube into the hole and sucked the baby's brains out. I nearly threw up as I watched him do these things. Next, Dr. Haskell delivered the baby's head, cut the umbilical cord, and delivered the placenta. He threw the baby in a pan, along with the placenta and the instruments that he had used. I saw the baby move in the pan. And I asked another nurse, and she said, it was just reflexes. The woman wanted to see her baby, so they cleaned up the baby, and they put it in a blanket, and they handed it to her. She cried the whole time, and she just kept saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I was crying, too. I, I couldn't take it. That baby had the most perfect, angelic face I have ever seen. And in all my professional years, I had never experienced anything like this. I don't think about abortion the same way anymore. And I still have nightmares about what I saw. You're told by the follow the science, political, unelected, bureaucratic degenerates that if you don't support that, you don't follow the science. I think we are way past the point of saying this and saying this clearly. Science is a meaningless term in the lexicon of the left. Science is nothing but a sticker that the secular progressive moral revolution slaps over their bigotry 
to disguise their true agenda and keep the American public confused because they think you're a bunch of stupid Republican degenerate rubes who can't make sense of the science. I'd like to ban the phrase follow the science from American political discourse. The people who say that generally believe that there are human non-persons, that there are 150 genders, and that men can turn into women and women can turn into men. We are contending against an alternative religion that masquerades as science. We all know we're killing babies, and we all know they're human beings. I agree with Dr. Fauci. We should follow the science. And the science states that from the moment of conception, you were a distinct, living, and whole human being. Distinct because the body in her body is not her body, which is why I, as a pre-born male that was in my mother's body, had rights, and my mother did not have a penis. Wait! Follow the argument! If the body in her body is her body, then all parts of that body are part of her body. Therefore, pregnant women have two fingers, have 20 fingers, 20 toes, two brains, two different hearts, two different DNA codes, potentially two different blood types existing simultaneously. And if she's pregnant with a boy, well, there you go. Now pregnant women have male genitalia. And of course, Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci go, yes, yes, that's our point. Yes, they, women can have male genitalia because, you know, because, you know, transgenderism which is why the assistant director of the HHS is a man who thinks he's a woman and demands that you call him Rachel and condones genital mutilation of minors. I want you to ask yourself this question. What is it about secular progressivism that makes you want to chop up children? Right? If they don't chop them up in the womb, they put radical transgender sexual libertinism education on them to convince them that they can be the other gender and then tell them we should chop you up. <laughs> It's a very interesting question, isn't it? What is it about secular progressivism that makes you want to chop up kids? And they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. You were living because, did you know this? Ready for this follow the science? Did you know dead things don't grow? It's super sciencey. I know. Just trust me. I think I heard it in sixth grade biology. And the unborn child meets all the requirements for a living thing that we learned in sixth grade biology. And you were a whole human being from the moment of conception. And this is the most important concept I'll leave you with this evening. Don't confuse being a whole human being with being a developed human being. Because that's exactly what the left does in their debauched view of personhood. They conflate your rights and your personhood with how developed you are. Which is why they say uh, you can kill the baby through abortion because what? They're, they don't have any desires. They're not cognitive. They can't feel pain. Right? They're not conscious. But those are developmental markers that will be realized as the real human being gradually unfolds their potential. So they confuse development with whether you're a whole human being. You were a whole human being from the moment of conception. You already had everything you needed to realize your full growth and development as a participating member of the human species. So here's what I mean by this. You guys remember Polaroid cameras? Remember? The young people are like, the Polo what? Is that the new iOS update? <laughs> no, it's a camera that spits the photo out as soon as you take it and you shake it as it develops, right? I guess they're, they're cool. That's a hipster, right? All the old becomes new and now they're, on, they're for sale everywhere again. And so let's say you capture a picture of just a gorgeous winter Denver sunset coming over the snowy peaks and it's the most gorgeous sunset you've ever seen. And right after you take it, I, pretending to be a woman, rip the photo out of your hands, tear it up into tiny little pieces, and throw it on the side of the ground. Now, are you upset with me? But what if I say, uh, bro, <laughs> sis, calm down, chill out. It was, it was never a picture of a sunset. It was just a black smudgy on a white piece of paper. You would probably look at me and say, you transgender weirdo, the sunset was already there. We just couldn't see it yet. Everything that was necessary for that photo to realize its full development was already present 
when the photo got spit out. It just needed time. That's what I mean when I say from the moment of conception, you were a distinct living and whole human being who already had everything you needed to realize your full growth and development as a participating member of the human species, even if we couldn't see you yet, you also just needed time. You see, people confuse prenatal human development with constructed things. And here's what I mean by that. Have you guys ever seen a car on an assembly line or a Corvette have these pieces added as it's assembled? People think of human development like that. Pro-abortion activists think that human development is synonymous with a constructed thing. But you see, constructed things gradually come into existence, don't they? Let me prove it to you. Who thinks that you have a Corvette when you've just got the frame? Oh, no one. Who thinks you've got a Corvette when you've got the frame and the wheels? Hmm. What about the frame, the wheels, and the steering, and the drive shaft? And uh, anyone? No? Some of you in here would say, until that bad boy has a sexy paint job, that thing ain't a Corvette. <laughs> because constructed things gradually come into existence as different parts are added. That's how they think about you in the womb. That's how they think about babies. That's why they'll say you can abort the baby because they're not cognitive. They're not self-aware. They're not conscious. Different parts being added that at some point, and they can never give us the line or what point that is, at some point, it's the thing that it will become. And at that point, it has rights. Constructed things gradually come into existence. Developed things come into existence all at once and then gradually unfold their potential according to their nature. So there is no such thing as a potential human. <laughs> there are only actual human beings with great potential. Hashtag follow the science. Oh wait, but they don't follow that science. They were never interested in science. They were interested in power. And where could the obsession with power be more evident than the slaughter of unborn children. Reminds me of another pro-abort, feminist Camille Paglia at the University of Arts in Philadelphia wrote a Salon.com article in 2008. And here's what she said. She said, hence I have always frankly admitted that abortion is murder. The extermination of the powerless by the powerful. Liberals, for the most part, have shrunk from facing the ethical consequences of their embrace of abortion, which results in the annihilation of concrete individuals and not just clumps of insensate tissue. Camille Paglia, a pro-abortion activist and one of the most honest among them, who says that I'm right when we say, it's not a potential human being. It's a concrete individual gradually unfolding their potential. But every argument used to justify killing that unborn child can be turned right around and used as an argument to justify killing some other born person who doesn't meet the litmus test for personhood. And during q and I'm happy to get in to any of the questions of those arguments and how we debunk them. Let me end with, with this. A old man approached a pro-life singer by the name of Penny Lee many, many years ago. Uh, if you've been around the pro-life movement for a long time, you might remember Penny Lee. And this man was so moved by her story and her singing about the sanctity of life that he felt burdened to tell his story. And this is what this gentleman said. He said, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust, and I considered myself a Christian. I attended church since I was a small boy, and we had heard the stories of what was happening to the Jews, but like most people today in this country, we tried to distance ourselves from the reality of what was really taking place. What could anyone do to stop it, right? A railroad track ran behind our small church 
and each Sunday morning we would hear the whistle from a distance and then the clacking of the wheels moving over the track. We became disturbed when one Sunday we noticed cries coming from the train as it passed by. We grimly realized then that the train was carrying Jews. They were like cattle in those cars. Week after week, that train whistle would blow. We would dread to hear the sound of those old wheels because we knew that the Jews would begin to cry out to us as they passed our church. It was terribly disturbing. But we could do nothing to stop those poor, miserable people, and yet their screams tormented us. But we knew exactly what time that whistle would blow. And so we decided that the only way to keep from becoming so disturbed by the cries was to start singing our hymns. By the time that train came rumbling past the churchyard, we were singing at the top of our voices. And if some of the screams reached our ears, we'd just sing a little louder. Years have passed by and no one talks about it much anymore. But I still hear that train whistle in my sleep. I still hear them crying out for help. God forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians yet did nothing to intervene. For nearly 50 years, the American church has been singing louder over the silent screams of preborn children. The silence of the people and the silence of the shepherds once led Francis Schaeffer to say, every abortion center ought to have a sign out front that says, open with the permission of the Church of Jesus Christ. But you know, the woke Christians among me say, Seth, that's not fair. You've been called to the abortion fight and I've been called to the poverty fight. There's a lot of issues on God's heart and we should pursue every extension of justice and you should not expect me to take on the burden that you do. So Seth, stop saying that. Abortion's not happening with the permission of the church. We're just called to different issues. But isn't it funny that the same people who say that will turn right around and say that the Holocaust happened with the permission of the church and slavery happened with the permission of the church? Which would lead to this question. Do the blood of unborn children not run deep enough or hot enough to warrant their political intervention? Why does the abuse of the black man and the Jew disturb you so much that you say that happened with the permission of the church, but the bloodshed of 65 million babies doesn't disturb you enough to say that is happening with the permission of the church. In Isaiah 1, the Israelites were having wonderful worship services in Jerusalem. And in the evening, they were just walking a half mile to the valley of Ben-Hinnom where they were cooking their children. They were having a lot of religious activity. But God says, I'm tired of your songs. I'm tired of your festivals. I'm tired of your services. I'm not listening to you anymore because your hands are full of blood. So seek mercy, pursue justice, correct oppression, plead the cause of the orphan and the widow. If we want to turn this American experiment around and we want to have a revival in this country again, we need to give God a reason to show us mercy. And that mercy and that revival, or to quote our founders, that new birth of freedom, pun intended, is not going to happen until we turn from this wickedness. Brothers and sisters, I'll see you on the battlefield. Now go out there and give them heaven, yeah?